Um, welcome everyone. There'll be a bunch more people joining us. Um, and uh, uh, hope everyone is doing well. Want to uh, welcome everyone to the seventh session of the community of practice. Um, and I want to, as before, I want to thank our co sponsors, uh, especially the American Public Health Association, and uh, uh, for allowing the CE credits, but also allowing Neely to work with us as a, a, an intern on the project and ca Campaign for Trauma Informed Policy and Practice, and Jesse Kohler for running the whole uh, webinar system, uh, and Trauma Informed Oregon uh, for allowing Christy to work with us as an uh, intern, but also the Alliance for Healthy. Nurses for Healthy Environments, the Community Resilience Initiative, uh, the Smart Start Program in North Carolina, the Scottish Community Development Center, the Mycelium Youth Network, and Resource Trauma Resource Institute. You heard from Elaine last week. Um, I want to start with uh, just as we normally do, uh, with a uh, just a presencing pause to allow yourself to become centered. Uh, this time, I'm not going to suggest any one uh, a skill that you want to use. Just uh, choose one that resonates with you. We have talked about uh, a number of them. There's saying soft to yourself as you breathe in and breath as you breathe out. There's resourcing, bringing to mind uh, experiences, people, places, uh, real or imagined that bring, that bring you calmness and peace or tracking your nervous system, your sensations in your body, and focusing on those that feel pleasant or neutral, grounding, feeling uh, supported by something solid and sensing the sensations that happen when you do that. Six second breathing, where you breathe in for four seconds, counting to four, and then breathe out, counting to six. Hand on belly, uh, belly and chest breathing, uh, where you put your hand on your belly and chest and you watch your belly uh, extend further as you breathe in breathe, uh, and, then, uh, and then withdraw as you breathe out. And other resilient skills, presencing skills you might like to practice. So just let's just take just a few moments to center and ground ourselves uh, being here now uh, by practicing whatever presencing skill resonates with you for just a, a few moments, if you're willing. And as you practice that skill, just sort of notice what's happening within you without trying to change anything. There's no right or wrong, no right way, bad way, hard, nothing to change. Just notice what's happening. And as you practice these skills, uh, try to always remember that when you experience or see devastating news of some kind, or you feel hopeless or helpless, before doing anything, come back to your breath or any other presencing skill that you practice. Don't do or say anything until you have had time to touch the peace and calm that presencing can bring. It's really, really helpful. I mostly use breath-based practices because of my background, uh, but you can use whatever presencing skill you have just to come back to yourself, try to become more present before doing or saying anything, uh, especially when you're distressed. So with that, uh, today, we're going to focus on the fourth foundational area that our research showed is really going to be vital to build universal population level capacity for mental wellness and transformation resilience during the climate emergency. Uh, and that is to actively engage residents in very specific practice that research shows builds and sustain wellness and resilience. 
Uh, and the presenter is going to be Dr. Everett Worthington. He's going to join us uh, in an hour. Uh, he's the Commonwealth Professor Emeritus at Virginia Commonwealth University, and he really is one of the experts on running cam uh, forgiveness campaigns in communities, uh, which is really going to be one of those core areas. Um, before we uh, go further, though, I'd like you to just uh, take, uh, we'll take 10 minutes and just connect again uh, with uh, breakout rooms and just sort of share, if you will, if you would, how you feel right now in one word, what you took away from last week's session by Elaine Miller Karras and the work I did, and you know where you are with the community practice in general, and how this has influenced you and your work or your life, and what you still want to learn. So Christy's going to divide you up into uh, breakout rooms of, I guess, four people or so, four or five, and uh, we'll see you in 10 minutes. Thanks. All right, looks like everyone's headed on over. Well, welcome back, everyone. Um, I hope you had at least a few minutes to uh, say hello to everybody. Uh, if anybody has anything they'd like to uh, share that came out of that, uh, out of your breakout room, please uh, post that in chat and uh, we can uh, get a, a moment to, uh, to talk about it uh, sometime here soon. Um, but uh, I want to now sort of because only because of lack of time, I want to continue on today. Um, and uh, uh, what we talked about is the five core elements, the five foundational areas that are going to be vital to build population level capacity to help everyone build their strength, their capacity for mental wellness and resilience for the climate emergency. We started off by hearing different ways to build social connections across boundaries in the community. We then learned about uh, how to ensure a just transition by creating supportive climate resilient built physical economic and ecological conditions last week we focused on developing mental wellness and resilience literacy we didn't finish that last week so that's what i'm going to do in the next hour before dr worthington joins us and then we're going to focus in when he joins us on fostering engagement in specific practices that promote mental wellness and resilience so what in terms of mental wellness and res, uh, resilience literacy just to recap uh, there's sort of a hierarchy of, of important steps. And the first one is to help everyone uh, uh, develop knowledge about how trauma and toxic stress can affect their, their body, mind, and emotions. Uh, and we talked about that last week, and we had a little bit of practice on how to teach that to others. Um, uh, and then we, the second part of that is following up very closely is the, the knowledge of and ability to use simple self-administrable presencing and purposing skills. And we're going to talk about the other three in a second. So uh, again, after everyone uh, becomes trauma-informed, to use that phrase, um, that everyone should learn simple age and culturally appropriate resilience skills. The first is presencing skills, as we've talked about, and that's what Elaine miller Karras talked about last week, last week, to manage the push of our cycle biological drives, uh, and that is self-regulation and co-regulation skills. And so there's a whole range of them. We talked about them last week. We've only focused so far in our uh, resilience pauses in a few of them, uh, but you know, controlled breathing, six second breathing, you can just look at this. Uh, and there's others that are not on this list. Um, but so it has to be age and culturally and demographically appropriate, but you wanna check your community or check your neighborhood, check your organization, what skills resonate with with different groups, different populations, different individuals, and really find ways to share those skills and engage people in them. But the second practice then is a purposing. After people have had a chance to calm their body, mind, and emotion, you wanna help them learn how to find purpose. And this is to intensify the pull of our desires for uh, to have meaning and purpose in our life. And so here's one way to think about it. Um, we all have a, a sort of a level of, uh, of functioning that we go in that Lane talked about last week. It's the resilience zone. We go up and down within that a little bit, but within that we're able to make decent decisions uh, and live uh, well. 
but then an adverse event comes along uh, and it knocks us out of that resilience zone. Either uh, uh, we get frozen upstream, uh, up uh, out of it on the upside or on the downstream side, we're all agitated or angry, or we can become depressed. We're pushed outside of our resilience zone. If we have good presencing skills, most of us can bounce back, return to some level of where we were before that we were that adverse event, uh, and uh, you know you can call it bouncing back. We often think of that as resilience, being able to fit that bear. But actually, many people are able to actually rise above where they were previously uh, by using that adverse event uh, as a catalyst. Uh, and they can increase their sense of well-being well above their previous levels by holding the pain and trauma uh, in functional ways or while they do that. So if the pain and the trauma doesn't go away, it's just your capacity to hold them. You, you're able to hold them in a different way than when you can be dysfunctional. And it requires a choice. We can continue to suffer or we use the experiences to find new sources of meaning, purpose, and hope in life by using that experience to learn about the world. Wow, now I get it. Or the self, now I've learned something about myself. And to uh, live out the core values we want to live out, uh, live by in the midst of adversity. And then engaging in pro-social activities, but, uh, usually much best when better when you do it with others that give us healthy hope. And those three are the key elements, learning about the self and others, living at our core values, uh, and finding healthy hope uh, that is most uh, uh, possible by uh, engaging with others in pro-social activities. Those are the three elements of purposing. Um, so I'd like you to just, we're going to just talk about purposing for a few minutes. Bring to mind a difficult experience you've had in the past one to two months something that was very difficult for you. Maybe it was with your family, uh, your uh, significant other, your children, whatever it might be, something that really was difficult. Or maybe it's something at work uh, or other things. Maybe it's just uh, climate distress and anxiety. Just bring to mind a difficult experience and just try to remember that for a second. And if you can now remember that experience, we all have these, it's just the way life is. During or after that experience, did you ask yourself, what can I learn about the world or myself from this situation? Or during or afterwards, did you ask yourself what new pathways might not be, might now be open to me or available to me? Think about that. Did you ask that or were you just angry? Did you blame? Did you, you felt bad about yourself? Whatever it might be that your reaction was. And if you did ask those questions, what resulted? What, what was the outcome? And if you did not ask those questions, think about whether those questions would have been helpful in some way. And as you do that, anybody would like to put some comments in chat that would be helpful, you know. Did you ask those questions during the experience? And if so, what was the result or now looking back, could those questions either during or after the experience been helpful in some way? And it's really important to understand that those questions are really ways to reframe difficult situations. They really help change it. And reframing is really vital um, to being able to learn from about the self, about ourselves, about the world through adversities. I can't see chat. I don't know if there's anything in chat. Uh, Lily or Christy, is there any comments that want to anybody want to share? Yes, Jessica actually just posted um, a reframing question. What is the lesson here? The, her question is, what is the lesson? Um, I think uh, the question that a reframing of your question from before, what can we learn about the world? Hers is about the lessons that we can be learned here. 
Uh, Mark also commented, these questions enable disidentification, giving space that allows me to consider where my purpose aligns or can be modified in response. Excellent. Yeah, that's right on target. Thanks, Mark. Okay. So trying to reframe the experience to, again, that's a good way to, good way to say that, Mark, to get a little distance from it. It's like, what can I learn from this? Uh, how can I uh, learn and grow from it and find new meaning and purpose? Uh, that's one vital step. Another way that can be added to that or done on its own is to try to live out the core values you value the most during adversities. Um, and values return, refer to actions, not ideals or morals or goals. They are how you act in life, not what you accomplish. Uh, and when we act out our values, when we live our values, uh, it allows us to live with meaning, purpose, and hope and, and, and dignity. So what I'd like to do is ask you to go through this list and just identify one of the top values, since there's undoubtedly going to be more, that you that would allow you to live with dignity, meaning, and purpose in the midst of adversities. You know, the first list it might be, I just, one of my values is always being honest with myself and others. Or it could be going down that list, uh, uh, really tapping into my sense of God. Or the second column there, it might be to be loyal or to really focus on social justice. Everybody's, I'm going to treat everybody the same. Uh, or the third uh, uh, column it might be, I, I want to have mercy for others or respect from others. Just take a moment to go through this list and pick out one of the top values that you really important to you, that you think will give you dignity, meaning, and purpose in the midst of adversities. We usually do this exercise when we have a regular long workshop and give people lots of time because what normally happens is there's six or seven important values. And then we ask people to really think that through to try to come up with the top three values. And it's often difficult. But let's for now, let's do one, one of your most important values that would allow you to live with dignity, meaning, and purpose. And if you've gotten, if you've identified one value, now go back to that difficult experience I first asked you to identify and determine, did you live out that value during that difficult experience? And if you did, what was the benefit or what happened as a result? And if you didn't, could it have made a difference in some way? And again, if you have any thoughts or comments, please feel free to share that in chat. And what's important here is to keep in mind what it is we think is important for ourselves, because when our fear and alarm center is activated, uh, that part of our brain, when we sense a threat, uh, where we go into a fight, flight, or if it's overwhelming, a freeze mode, and we often forget how we want to live and what will give us dignity, meaning, and purpose in the midst of adversity. So working with people in your community, in your neighborhood, or organization, to help everybody just identify their core values and try to remember them and remember the benefits by thinking through how they would apply those in an adverse situation can be very, very helpful. Are there any comments in chat? Uh, none yet, but I'll let you know. All right. Oh, actually, we just got one from Vivian. <laughs> Thank you, Vivian. Uh, 
So Vian says, in February, my job was outsourced, so I retired using self-compassion and gratitude that I could retire. I now have time to pursue this class. Thank you. And Jennifer also says, for me, integrity and open-mindedness are two sides of the same coin. And Lola says, community for me, uh, social discussion, participation, uh, connection, and connection to nature. And this is compassion as well, opening the door for other values. And being aware of those values and then practicing those in the midst of adversities is really, really vital. Thank you. Thank you all for sharing that. So you first, you try to reframe the situation to learn from it. Uh, you then try to clarify the core values you want to live by and, and find how, ways to do that. Often you make a mistake, but you want to go back and sort of just tap into those core values a lot. And then you want to be able to help yourself and help residents harvest hope for new possibilities. That's the third key to purposing. Because when you have hope, that's what allows you to overcome despair. But when you have hope, you also begin to realize healthy hope. You can begin to realize that how you respond is up to you. How we respond is up to us. It's not just fate. We really make choices to do that. So what I'd like you to do is just identify a time when you did something helpful for someone else or for animals or for nature without a sense of obligation or expected payoff. So if you just bring to mind, for example, when you just uh, you were walking somewhere and you just opened a door and held it open for somebody to walk through, or uh, a senior or somebody dropped something on the ground and you just bent over and you picked it up and you, you handed it to them. Just something very simple for somebody else, or maybe you petted an animal that looked a little distressed or whatever. Just, just try to bring to mind some time when you did something helpful for someone else or nature without obligation. Most of us have something like that. And it could be pretty recent and very simple. And then try to remember how you felt afterwards. What went on within you after you experienced that? How did you feel about yourself? How did your body feel? Anybody have a comment on that? Quickly put it in chat. Laura says glowing. Glowing, great. Becky says being kind to others always feels good. Jennifer says uplifted. Wonderful. These are beautiful words. Wonderful. And that's true. When we do things for others or help the world be a better place without uh, any kind of uh, obligation, we enhance our own self-esteem and our own sense of self-efficacy. And what's actually happening is we're, it's actually a, a, a neurological reaction in our body. Uh, we're activating the, the oxytocin uh, virtuous cycles, it's called. So selfless pro-social actions feel good, which activates the release of oxytocin in our body, which feels good. That's the buzz we feel, which drives us to want to do more selfless behaviors, which releases more oxytocin, which drives more selfless behavior. That's called the oxytocin virtuous cycle. So in engaging in pro-social activities is not just about being nice to others or moralism. Uh, it's also an expanded notion of self-interest. Helping others and or the natural environment, but benefits us as much as it benefits society. And it is most powerful when we do this with somebody else. Uh, and when we talk about healthy hope, then what we find is that research has identified three really closely related factors that are critical to finding healthy hope. One is people have a vision of a place they want to arrive at or condition they want to achieve. They, they have a sense of where they want to go. Uh, they have a, a sense of the initial steps they can take and the overall approach they can take to move in that direction. Uh, and a commitment to join with others 
to move towards that vision, even when obstacles arrive. Um, th this is really out of hope research. That's really critical. So it's not just wild hope. Oh, I hope things are going to be better. It's when people really develop healthy hope, it's really having a specific vision of something they want to do, a condition they want to create, et cetera, a sense of how they can begin that in sort of an overall direction. And then to, whenever you can, a commitment to join with others to move towards that vision, even when obstacles arrive, because you're going to, you have a path and you're going to have an obstacle, you might have to change your path. In fact, you likely will, especially as the climate emergency worsens. So to help uh, facilitate this capacity to build healthy hope, it's important to help people develop a purposing action plan. Last week at the end, very briefly, I shared a, uh, the uh, having people develop a presencing action plan, but developing your own purposing action plan and helping others do that is can also be very helpful. We do that when we're at learning longer workshops. We don't have time today. Uh, for people, but we have people develop, write down their core values, write down the goals, how do they want to enhance their own sense of well-being, and how do they want to enhance the well-being of others in the natural environment. They, have, they write down the initial uh, actions they'll take, uh, the mid-term and longer-term actions, the barriers they're likely to take, the strategies for overcoming the barriers uh, and the benefits, etc. You can even have them put in dates if you want. Um, so it's a tool that can be very, very helpful. To, uh, and then, you know, again, people can put this on a postcard and put it on their mirror at home in the bathroom uh, or at their desk at work or whatever. So they continue to remind themselves to practice pre uh, purposing. So let's teach purposing now. Um, uh, you've just sort of heard the overall approach. Um, and one person, we're going to do these in, I think, actually just 10-minute breakout rooms again. One person be the teacher and teach presencing for three minutes maximum. One person be the student. One person be the observer. When the teacher is done teaching, uh, the observer shares what they saw within both the student and the teacher. Then the uh, student should share what it was like for them. And then lastly, the teacher shares. Uh, what it's like. And uh, we're going to, uh, I, I guess, uh, Neely's going to post a graphic in chat that uh, the, the, the first one I showed you already that you can use as a reminder of the what you want to focus on. So we're going to break up now uh, into breakout rooms of three people and we'll practice uh, getting a, a sense of how to teach purposing to others. And Bob, do you want this to be 10 minutes or 12 minutes? Let's just go for 10 now. Okay. All right, I'm going to send you a letter. Great. Okay. Great. Well, welcome back, everyone. Uh, if you have any comments on what that was like uh, for you teaching it, uh, please uh, share it in, in chat. Um, we don't have, uh, I wish we had more time just to have a discussion about it. But, and we will have more time next week to really wrap up and have a long discussion about that. But um, I, I hope it, and as often is the case with teaching anything for the first time, it's sort of sometimes it can take a while to, to clarify. And you also have to tap into and clarify who is the student? What are they going to resonate with? How should I frame my language, my discussion about that based on their age and their, their background? So uh, something to, 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 to think about. Um, so I just want to finish now because uh, Dr. Worthington is going to join us. I have maybe might be on the line already um, uh, about mental wellness and resilience literacy. So uh, this is we just covered knowledge and uh, uh, and the ability to use to help everyone develop the ability to use presencing and purposing skills. Uh, but just as importantly um, is developing knowledge skills to assist others with mental health problems. And learning how to teach uh, presencing as purposing is really important for that. And learning how to teach about the trauma, uh, big help everybody become trauma informed, but also psychological first aid uh, can be very helpful here during emergencies. This is really um, during disasters, you want to help people find safety, comfort, connectedness, uh, and some hope. Uh, and so learning psychological first aid is, is very helpful for that. Uh, and then 
there's going to be some people who uh, really still need knowledge about how to obtain additional information or resources when they experience a mental health problem. Uh, and uh, mental health first aid um, can help with this. This is training uh, people in your community about how to identify and understand and respond to symptoms of mental health problems, substance abuse problems, et cetera. Um, and uh, also then knowledge about how to seek treatment uh, for mental health problems, because people often, by fear of stigmatization or other reasons, they don't want to get treatment, perfectly understandable. But mental health first aid can be helpful for that also. Uh, and uh, just want to encourage you to think about how you can get psychological first aid and mental health first aid. I wish they had always come up with different ways to describe it because it's confusing between the two. How to get that those two skills out there in your community uh, uh, as the client before the climate emergency worsens. Um, so that's the elements of building mental wellness re resilience literacy. And as you do that, uh, as people learn those skills and practices and information, you also want to engage residents in specific practices that sustain their capacity for mental wellness and resilience. Um, and as we talked about, a public health approach to preventing and healing mental health problems uh, provides uh, or involves ongoing systemic efforts, not single siloed efforts, uh, to transform norms, attitudes, habits, and behaviors. Uh, so as residents engage in the other three foundational areas that we talked about and the fifth that we'll talk about next week, uh, healing circles, uh, it's really important to uh, regularly engage them in specific practices that research shows can help build and sustain their capacity for mental wellness and resilience. And these practices help will help shift the, their object of attention from distress or anger or hopelessness, whatever else they might be experiencing, to forces that can activate transformational resilience, that can activate their capacity to practice presencing and purposing. And just like the other practices, they're much, they're most powerful when they're done with others. So there are six practices that our research uh, and research in general really shows are very helpful. There's others, but these are very important uh, as the climate emergency worsens. The first is to laughing a lot. We've got to allow people to laugh. It actually releases the stress that's buried in our nervous system. One of the great uh, 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 ways to do this, and I would encourage you all to look this up in Victoria, British Columbia, a group was involved with building neighborhood resilience uh, and they developed their own uh, uh, podcast or, or show called Laughing Aloud, a guide to how to make physical comedy shows to build neighborhood resilience. It's fabulous and it's really funny. Uh, and uh, it's something you can do in your community. Use that guide and then have your community develop its own, own one. Another is Go Clowns, um, which I spent quite a bit of time with. They, they train people in how to promote therapeutic laughter. So you can get some residents in your community trained in how to promote therapeutic laughter. And they go into different organizations, different uh, community settings to help people laugh in the midst of diversities. A, a closely related, but not quite the same uh, 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 practice is to find simple joys during the midst of ongoing adversities. Um, uh, it's really uh, 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 finding ways to just uh, appreciate uh, and find joy in what, what you have. Uh, in the UK, there's action for happiness campaigns that have been very helpful. There's the spread through joy through new uh, neighborhood art program in Missouri. And James Baraz, who is not going to join us today, uh, wrote a book called uh, uh, Finding Joy. Uh, and I would encourage you to look that up. Uh, he's, he and I teach meditation workshops together and have been friends for years, but uh, uh, that's another way you can do it. Another uh, step that's going to be vital is to help people care for their bodies. Um, and this includes eating well, eating healthily and getting physical exercise and in other ways caring for the body because as the climate emergency worsens, that's going to be difficult to do. Uh, a great initiative uh, is called Healthy Eatings to Reduce Obesity. That's done in rural communities. 
by uh, Community Coalitions for Change, C3 they call themselves. Play streets are another way to do that. Play streets uh, uh, are where uh, you close off streets to traffic and you put up basketball courts or other kinds of things and you allow youth to be physically active for a couple of hours. Uh, even when a place is, especially when they don't have that capacity. So that's a couple of resources. And again, I'm sharing these resources with you around these six core areas because to stimulate your innovation, your creativity, to sort of learn, oh, here's how they've done it. Here, let's create some innovative way in our community or in our neighborhood or in our organization. Uh, another one is to be grateful. Uh, be grateful for what you have already. And that really involves your friends and family, but also just being grateful that you're alive, uh, noticing the, 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 sky, the, the sunrise, the sunset, the, the, the birds around you, et cetera, nature. Um, uh, and there's uh, two, two programs that have really done this very well. Uh, there's the Attitude for, Gratitude, uh, Attitude for Gratitude campaign that's been run in Newport News, Virginia. And there's also Say Something Nice Day that's uh, now actually gone national in the US, although very few people know about it. Um, it's just not well known, but it's there. Say something nice, uh, be grateful once a day. And another one is to keep learning. Um, we're gonna have to continue to learn new things as the climate emergency worsens, uh, new ways to uh, to live our lives without uh, harming the environment, but also new ways to uh, uh, deal with uh, uh, emission reductions, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and there's a number of programs that are doing some excellent work on that. Uh, the UNESCO's Global Network of Learning Communities is really an exciting program that's really engaging folks in how to learn. And you've already seen the Rural Opportunities Institute way to help people learn about trauma by engaging them in systems mapping. So those are some of the uh, ways. And then uh, what we have, our research shows is very vital is to practice forgiveness, engage members in practicing forgiveness. And that's because uh, as the stresses and traumas related to the climate emergency uh, uh, aggra uh, accelerate, people are going to continue to do things that harm others or the natural environment is because they are dysregulated their fight flight or freeze reactions are are triggered and we are likely to do things that uh, affect unaffect uh, negatively affect others or the natural environment so we need to practice forgiveness for others and practice forgiveness for ourselves and I've invited uh, Dr. Everett Worthington to join us today. Uh, and I, I don't know if he, I haven't seen if he's on the line, but he might be. But uh, Dr. Worthington, um, I uh, thank you for joining us uh, and uh, taking the time to, to share your work on how to organize and run uh, forgiveness campaigns in communities. And with that, uh, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Worthington. Well, great. Thank you, Bob. I appreciate it. And uh, let's see if I can work the technology here. Uh, I will try to share my screen. Yes, let's see. Uh, hmm. We can see it, Dr. Worthington. Um, there we go. I was trying to get it on to where it would uh, it keep up with me. Well, I, it, it really is good to be with you all and, uh, and to be able to talk with you about something that has uh, been really, I think, exciting for me in the last few years. Um, I uh, hope to cover four major things uh, in the next 15 to 20 minutes how became involved in community campaigns, what forgiveness means, how to run a community campaign. And, uh, you know, I say, does it work? Spoiler alert, yes, it does. So I hope I haven't ruined everything for you uh, and you'll be able to cope with the rest of the talk. And then lastly, uh, practical uh, suggestions for how to run a campaign. So that's my mission, should I decide to accept it. Uh, so, how did I become involved in these campaigns? 
Um, well, I, I have a life mission, and that life mission is to do all I can to promote forgiveness in every willing heart, home, and homeland. And so uh, I uh, had for years been involved in uh, looking at a, 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 an intervention to help people forgive in groups or individually um, called Reach Forgiveness. And uh, was really interested in that uh, forgiveness in every willing homeland part of, uh, of my mission. And so in about 2004, I did a, a study to look at the REACH forgiveness groups, but we needed a control group. And so what we did was uh, I worked with the leadership on campus to try to arrange uh, a, a campus-wide intervention that hopefully got to uh, everyone on campus. Well, it turned out that it worked quite well uh, and served as a very nice control group for the, uh, or control condition for the uh, forgiveness groups that we were running. The groups plus the campus-wide intervention worked better than the campus-wide intervention alone, but it was surprisingly effective. Uh, I was encouraged by that. I, I did another study with uh, the leadership of Asbury University uh, in 2007, and that was published in 2008. And then that led me to, to uh, apply for a grant with the Fetzer Institute. And Fetzer Institute uh, gave me a grant to look at this in Christian colleges. And so over the course of the time there, uh, I looked at that at uh, Southwest Baptist University. So you can see a, a variety of theologies within Christian uh, colleges and universities, Luther College, uh, three Methodist or Wesleyan universities, Bethel University, Indiana Wesleyan, and, and Asbury again, uh, Northwestern College, which was a Reformed theology, and Biola University, Reformed theology. And then Bowling Green State University, so this is a secular state university. So, so let me uh, talk quickly about what I think forgiveness is, and um, this may not be exactly the way that you understand forgiveness, but this is, I think, the way that I would say 98% of the people who study forgiveness uh, think about it. So, we begin by looking at a sense of injustice that might occur when we're offended or hurt. And that the, the size of that injustice gap is related to how hard it is to deal with that injustice. So large gaps, hard to deal with, small gaps, easier to deal with. So it turns out that there are many ways to deal effectively with a sense of injustice. Forgiveness is only one of those possible ways. Uh, so I listed several, uh, you know, seeking or seeing justice done, turning it over to God, tolerating it, forbearing, which is basically tolerating it, but for a purpose of, you know, I, I'm putting up with this for the good of the community or for the good of my marriage or uh, for the good of my family. And so that's uh, forbearance, acceptance. Okay, life is too short. I'm just going to accept this and move on and forgiveness. So so there are these alternatives to forgiving, and people can mix and match those to deal with that sense of injustice. So the, the weight of dealing with injustices certainly does not all fall on the shoulders of forgiveness. It, it's shared in a, a variety of ways of dealing with this. And obviously, people don't have to use all of these ways. They'd use whatever works for them. So I believe there are two different types of forgiveness. One is to make a decision about how we intend to act toward a person who has hurt or offended us. I'm not going to get even with them, and I'm going to treat them as a valued and valuable person. So that's a behavioral intention. It's not a behavior, because even if the person died tonight and I, and I did not get to carry out my intentions, I've still forgiving them, forgiven them decisionally. 
but I can make a decision to forgive and carry it out for the rest of my life and treat that person uh, as a valuable person. And yet, every time I think about that uh, event, I get upset and resentful and bitter and hate-filled and, and angry and anxious. And so that suggests that there must be a second type of forgiveness that we call emotional forgiveness which is, involves the emotional replacement of negative, unforgiving emotions with more positive, uh, other-oriented emotions like empathy for the person or sympathy or, or uh, love or compassion for the person. So forgiveness is different than reconciling. Forgiveness happens inside my skin. It's a decision or it's an emotional change. But reconciliation is a matter of restoring trust in a relationship. And, and I cannot control reconciliation myself. It is a matter of a dyad or a community uh, wanting to restore that trust. And if part of that community will not is not willing to be trustworthy, if they continue to want to hurt the other part, Reconciliation will not hard, uh, will not happen, even though forgiveness could happen. So forgiveness is in our control, more or less. At least decisions to forgive is more in our control. Emotions are harder to control. Self-forgiveness is is really psychologically much more uh, much more similar to being a wrongdoer. Because usually my major psychological experience with self-forgiveness is not forgiving. It's actually dealing with my self-condemnation of, you know, why I'm blaming myself, why I regret what I may have done or, or not done. So self-forgiveness turns out to be uh, often harder than forgiving other people. And one of those reasons is because to be responsible with my self-forgiveness and not just let myself off the hook. Uh, I need to, to do some things to restore my sense of responsibility. I need to make things right with whatever I hold to be sacred. I need to make things right as much as I can with people who have been harmed by my actions. And I need to make things right psychologically. So what you just got there was an entire book of, the, uh, of a theory about what forgiveness is supported by, I might say, a lot of research uh, on the stress and coping uh, model. So there are lots of ways that people, oh, I, I, I've already mentioned these ways of uh, uh, managing injustices. So So this uh, intervention that I developed called REACH Forgiveness, uh, it, it stands for, the, the REACH stands for five steps to get to emotional forgiveness. Recalling the hurt, empathizing with the person who hurt me, giving a person an altruistic, undeserved gift of forgiveness, they don't deserve that if they've hurt me, but that's a gift I can give. And then committing to the forgiveness I experience so that I can hold on whenever doubts occur. Now, it turns out that that program has been supported in over 30 randomized controlled trials that have been published. Uh, of those, uh, most of them are secular, uh, a, a secular version of this REACH Forgiveness model, about 25 published randomized control trials, uh, eight with Christian samples. Uh, and then there is a big one that is un under review right now that is to come. Basically, these can be done in groups or they can be done as do-it-yourself workbooks. So the important point of this is that, that the effectiveness of, of producing forgiveness in a person's life depends on how long that they seriously try to forgive. So that is, there's a, 
uh, regression line that predicts that uh, over all of the studies, regardless of whose approach it is, uh, it's a straight line relationship. More time spent seriously trying to forgive yields more forgiveness. Also, it yields better uh, uh, dealing with depression and better dealing with anxiety. And we have just uh, recently shown in a number of studies uh, also more flourishing. So uh, then there's this straight line relationship. So uh, I give my web address there where there are massive amounts of free information available at fworthington-forgiveness.com. So helping uh, a, a society uh, be more forgiving, um, we look at, at what are called mediating communities. Y'all are probably familiar with this, but these are smaller communities that make up and uh, affect and are affected by larger communities. So for example, this might be churches or Boy Scout or Girl Scout uh, 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 communities within a larger community or a city, so or even workplaces. So uh, trying to uh, change communities, we began by trying to create awareness raising of forgiveness. And we did this in three Christian colleges. Basically, uh, what we found is that that has a small positive effect, that if I can raise awareness uh, the, of forgiveness in communities that already value forgiveness, notice these are all Christian communities, uh, then that has a small positive effect. How did we do this? We we went into the communities, worked with the leadership. They planned things, but we gave them a lot of ideas. We gave them a, a big list of things that could be done, you know, university-wide, things that could be done uh, with uh, students alone, things that could be done as a group, or, or things that can be done as competitions. So they chose usually about half of their their interventions uh, from this list, and about half they made up that was uh, really relevant to their own community. So it was important in a, in awareness raising campaigns to uh, one uh, work with a community that already values uh, forgiveness, and two. Uh, have clear objectives, and our objectives were to raise awareness that forgiveness is of two types, not one, that emotions can be separated out from decisions about how you're going to act, and they scientifically are related with a correlation of about 0.4, which is not a strong correlation, but it's not a weak correlation either, but they're not joined at the hip with each other. They can be done in either order. I can have emotional forgiveness and then make a decision or vice versa. Second objective, forgiveness has benefits. Uh, and uh, we detailed a lot of benefits that the science has shown, mental health benefits, relational benefits, spiritual benefits, and physical health benefits. And the third objective is that there are resources available within the community that help. Uh, such as easy to run reach forgiveness groups or do it with yourself uh, workbooks or counseling or, or other uh, uh, you know, uh, interventions within the community. So doing a, a kind of an after awareness, uh, I mean, an after action review of this, one of the things we found is that awareness um, was emphasized over actually forgiving. And so it did produce a certain amount of forgiveness, but not a lot. We found that when it worked best was when we got buy-in from the community leaders. If we didn't get a lot of buy-in, we didn't get a lot of progress. Uh, so uh, what we also found was that uh, often communities wanted to plan things that were pretty passive. So they would bring in speakers and chapel speakers or guest speakers or having people watch debates or read a book or 
uh, but not really engaging in activities. So there were there were a few active engagement activities done, and there were there was a little push, very little push from the leaders to engage in time-consuming activities that really got to people and had them do that work of spending the, the hours trying to forgive, such as participating in groups. So, so therefore, we thought, well, if we're going to make a real impact, we need to go beyond just raising awareness. And what we need to do is to make our goals to focus on raising awareness and stimulating forgiveness. So we did this with three, you know, Christian churches throughout the world, one in Australia, uh, one in Phoenixville, Pennsylvania, one in Richmond, Virginia. And we received a, a grant from the Templeton World Charity Foundation. It was a, a million dollar plus grant to do this with do-it-yourself workbooks uh, as part of it, but also run campaigns in Hong Kong, Indonesia, Ukraine, two different sites, Colombia, and South Africa. You'll notice these are high conflict areas that forgiveness is going to be uh, an issue. So in that grant, uh, we ran uh, these uh, community-wide campaigns. And I, I wanna show you just one of these from Colombia. And we used, uh, we sampled and studied pre and post 2,878 people at a secular non-religious uh, university in Monteria, uh, uh, Colombia, uh, and uh, that was almost a third of the entire student body that we were able to sample uh, uh, twice. Uh, we found changes in forgiveness, also reductions in depression, reductions in anxiety, and increases in flourishing in this large sample. So, uh, we we did, uh, uh, well, let me tell you some of the, uh, some of the results of the research questions. We had four research questions for this study. Was the campaign successful? Yes, it was. All of the pre-post changes were significant. And the effect size was actually pretty large. So this was quite a large change. Uh, that was especially for knowledge about forgiveness, but even for experiencing forgiveness, our effect size was 0.36. I don't know if that means anything to you, but in a meta-analysis of all of the intervention studies that existed, regardless of program, the mean effect size was 0.53. We did a public health intervention of an entire university, and we got about two thirds of the gains in forgiveness. We also had sub substantial gains in reducing depression in the campus, reducing anxiety in the campus, and increasing flourishing, although they were more modest than the gains in forgiveness. So, Research question number two, which types of activities affected the greatest change? And we found that uh, all of the campaign activities improved knowledge about forgiveness, some more than others. Most of the, them, the majority, improved trait forgiveness, 13 out of 14 types of, of uh, activities. Uh, 12 out of 14 increased emotional forgiveness and 12 out of 14 had increased the forbearance that people felt. Half of the activities improved a decision to forgive and reduced unforgiveness. And so even though we did not aim this campaign at mental health improvements, mental health was still affected nonetheless of the 16 types of campaign activities. Six types improved depression, four improved anxiety, and 12 improved flourishing. Research question number three, 
what was the association of number of types of activities people participated in and the uh, uh, effectiveness. Nearly everybody uh, participated in at least one of the 16 types of activities. On the average, people chose about seven types to participate in. I'm going to show you a, a, a slide next, and, and you'll see that there is a linear association. The more activities that people engaged in, usually the better that they re responded to that. So let me just sh show you that. And you can see in the upper left is uh, the relationship between number of, of activities participated in and forgiveness. So you can see if they participate in zero uh, activities, maybe they uh, they actually did not significantly forgive, but there's a, a very linear effect. Remember, the amount of time people spend trying to forgive is related to the amount of forgiveness at a linear level. And this shows it true in uh, public health as well as in individual interventions. The linear effect was a little less stark when it came to affecting flourishing or depression or anxiety, but you can see that there's a general linear trend in both in, in all three of those cases. So which types of activities produce change in forgiveness? Basically a knowledge test. And the way that this was done, I thought was very clever. Uh, what they did is they gave this knowledge test about forgiveness that had, I think 12 questions on it. And they said, if you get over 90%, we will enter your name in a drawing that's a, a lottery for uh, all kinds of goodies. And you can take this as many times as you want. All you have to do is score 90% on it at one of those times. So people just took it again and again and again. Well, you know, they're just re continually reinforming themselves about the, the knowledge uh, to get, you know, like five dollars worth of goodies as a, as a prize. So other activities that produce the largest change in forgiveness, forgiveness journaling, an animated video series, uh, the REACH workbooks, uh, for the people did three-hour REACH workbooks, uh, and then a forgiveness webinar uh, where uh, five international speakers uh, about forgiveness gave a one-hour talk each. The most popular activities were the knowledge test because they were going to win the lottery, participating in a forgiveness wall, just going and posting things on a forgiveness wall or a forgiveness tree where they tied things to the tree, I forgive so and so, uh, the Reach work, uh, Forgiveness Workbook and animated videos. Changes in mental health uh, symptoms was most related to the animated videos and positive psych webinars and changes in flourishing to the knowledge test, animated videos and forgiveness webinars. So after our, uh, after, uh, our after action review, you know, we found that written activities were not really associated with large changes and they, didn't get selected by participants much. The students just didn't like to do extra writing. Uh, and so they didn't. And so those were not very effective. Other brief experiential ad, uh, activities like going to the forgiveness wall or tree uh, or a mantra, uh, forget, creating a forgiveness mantra, those were popular, but they produced very small changes. Why? because it doesn't take long to go to a forgiveness tree and post something on it. So they don't spend time really thinking about forgiveness. The engaging videos, like the animated videos, uh, were popular and had large changes. The knowledge-based and practical applications, like the knowledge test and the REACH Forgiveness Workbook, were related to strong changes. The forgiveness webinars produce changes in forgiveness and flourishing. Positive psychology and mindfulness webinars were related to changes in mental health symptoms and flourishing, but not forgiveness as much. 
So practical advice, uh, just bullet points, identify uh, either a limited uh, mediating community for intervention or, or one that wants to become more forgiving. Engage leaders and administrators. Uh, the more you can get the leaders involved in wanting to push the things that involve and get people to spend time, the better. Establish different goals uh, for raising awareness and for producing forgiveness. Tailor interventions to the community or get the community involved in changing in, in creating their own interventions. Choose interventions that require time, but not too much time or effort. Uh, variety, but not too much variety. Try to convince people that they can forgive more if they work at it and not just passively show up. Get across the point that building more forgiveness takes time. A group workbook will be vital, if not essential. In general, more activities produces more change. Time-consuming activities often are not suggested. About three hours is the outside limit of what people will tolerate. Brief activities are be, will be popular but won't much, make much changes. And uh, if community influence influencers can give like extra credit, or make activities mandatory or highly recommended, participation goes way up. Entertaining events that also educate, uh, both reward people for participating and are fun, uh, and they promote forgiving, and then provide uh, concrete things for people to do to forgive in addition to and not in place of uh, the intervention. Uh, design feedback to get to learn about what worked and what didn't work. So my uh, contact information is here, and uh, I probably have exceeded my time already. Bob has, uh, you know, got the hook and is ready to drag me off to the side, but uh, I don't know. Do you want to uh, permit questions, or did I take too much time? No, you did. You did just fine, Dr. Worthington. <clears throat> Thank you so much for this very, very interesting presentation. Um, yeah, why don't we uh, take a few questions now? Um, uh, uh, if you can uh, close your screen, then yeah, we can see people. Right. Um, if uh, you have a question, uh, we'll just take a few. Can you just uh, raise your hand and we'll try to uh, have you just speak out? Let me actually start with a question that I have. Um, can you, uh, I know you did, so I used to live in Colombia many, many years ago. Can you just talk a little bit more about actually who you engaged and how that uh, uh, that program went? Uh, it was done at a, at a uh, private secular university, and uh, we had uh, a really good in with the leadership. So, um, the the woman who directed the campaign in Virginia uh, in uh, in Colombia, her mother actually was president of the university. Hmm, this was a nice buy-in right here, and so it, it, they encouraged a lot of participation. We had mo out of, we had twenty eight hundred and some odd uh, participants. Most of those were students. However, there were quite a number of faculty and staff who also participated. So there were over 100 faculty and staff that participated uh, as well as the students. So uh, there were 16 different types of activities. Different people chose different things depending on what they were interested in. Great, thank you. Yeah, when I, I was there, Lived down there many, many years ago, but it was, they were still having this, these conflicts, uh, tremendous conflicts, and people were always frightened, uh, even about being abducted, you know, for taken away as a hostage for money and all these kinds of issues. And so forgiveness there, I can see just, you know, not only really very tough, but very important. So uh, we, we did ask them to what degree had they been affected by the 60 years of uh, conflict in, in Colombia? And over half of them said that they had a uh, close family member or friend who had been injured in the course of the, the conflicts. So there was leftover, uh, uh, you know, I mean, this is 
college students and there was peace accords like seven years ago. So these these were kids when the peace accords were signed. So they haven't had quite as much conflict uh, since they've been of age. Right, great. Thank you, thank you. So um, I see a couple of questions here. Let me just read those to you very quickly. Um, uh, have you done any work with conservative Christians and progressives or with Republicans and Democrats trying to bridge the, or do you have any suggestions for how to bridge the gap there and forgive between the two warring parties, so to speak? Yeah, well, that's, that's a really great question. We had a grant funded study on um, political humility. And this was done uh, in the Chicagoland area. So it involved Wheaton College, which was a Christian college, a conservative Christian college, but it also involved two community colleges that were just secular, you know, community colleges. Uh, unfortunately, uh, what happened was we finished the study, and about the time we finished the study, the woman who was the principal investigator on the grant got pregnant. You know, I mean, she was pregnant before, but she delivered and her child has not been well. So she has been, you know, uh, trying to care for her child and has not gotten back to, uh, you know, analyzing the results on it. So that was a, an eight hour do it yourself workbook on political humility. So we're trying to um, help students develop a sense of, you know, the humility in which they become more other oriented uh, rather than kind of self-focused. Great. Thank you. Uh, and we see one other question. How does forgiveness uh, fit or relate to other core values that people hold? Uh, forgiveness is, is related to most virtues. Uh, so, um, you know, certainly related a, a lot to humility, you know, because it takes a certain amount of humility to forgive, and it takes a lot of humility to uh, confess wrongdoing to, to uh, one another. But gratitude, it's also related to gratitude. Uh, Self-control, uh, you know, obviously people who are more self-controlled and are more able to control their emotions in particular are able to forgive more. Um, so we did a, a, a study looking at, oh, and patience. Did I say patience before? But That's anyway, true. and also patience. So we did the study that looked at these uh, five uh, different virtues and it turned out that they were all largely connected to each other uh, and it, it's it's because I think I think self-control in a way and, and emotional regulation is at the root of all of those things so people who are able to um, regulate emotionally are more likely to engage in all of the virtues. Uh, and so, you know, you can think philosophically back to the, you know, the, the Greek uh, philosophers, and they saw virtue as being one whole that had, uh, you know, like a, an orange that had a lot of plugs in it that were the individual virtues, but uh, virtue being the orange. And I, I think that's pretty much what we found too. We, we actually ended up concluding that humility was probably the thing that drove more of the, the others than being driven by the others. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to share all this information with us and all the wonderful work you've been doing and, and continue to do. It's, we really, really appreciate it. Uh, and I hope that everybody got your, uh, uh, your, your contact and you might uh, hear from a number of people after that, and, because I think uh, find, helping people develop forgiveness for others and for the self are gonna be vital as the climate emergency worsens. Uh, for lots of different reasons. I see a lot of people saying thank you to you um, <clears throat> in chat here. So um, uh, with that, we're going to uh, 
to uh, move on. Uh, but thank you again, Dr. Evington, for yeah. taking the time. Yeah. Right before I leave, can I, I, I don't know if you have the ability to distribute the slides, but I would be willing to send you the slides and let you post them or send them out if people would like those slides. That would be wonderful. Yes, we do. We have a base camp site where we post all the presentations on. So if you can just send them to me, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll post okay. them. Good. So, Thank great. you. Thanks. Thank you so much. Take care. Enjoyed it. Great. Take care. Bye. Uh -huh. All right, let's just take a, just for a few seconds a resilience pause, just to sort of let things settle in terms of what you just heard. And you can choose whatever presencing skill you'd like. And we'll just do this for a few seconds, if you're willing. And then let's uh, go into 10 minute breakout rooms. Uh, we will have four or five people in each. Uh, and this uh, just uh, allows you some time just to talk about what you heard and gained from Dr. Worthington's presentation. And uh, just as importantly, can you see yourself implementing some type of forgiveness campaign in your neighborhood, your community, or your organization? Uh, and then identify any key questions. So. Uh, I think Neely is going to, or uh, Christy is going to break you up into breakout rooms and we'll see you in 10 minutes. Oh. Everyone's back. <laughs> Great, welcome back everyone, Get everybody back. Would anybody like to share, uh, just let's have an open conversation for the rest of the time we have here. Uh, you can just uh, raise your hand in chat or um, put something in chat and we can read it. Uh, what what did you take away from uh, Dr. Worthington's presentation? Can you see yourself organizing forgiveness campaigns in your neighborhood, your community? How would you do it? What kind of steps could you take? Just any thoughts, reactions to that? And or talking about the other elements of building mental wellness and resilience literacy. I'm happy to share. Um... So one thing I talked about is my backgrounds in nursing and many nurses felt betrayed during the pandemic. And this is um, cited even in a nurse theorist who deals with psychological trauma, who interviewed nurses. And so, um, you know, there's not, there's polarities in healthcare institutions. And one of the things I talked about was there's a woman named Jennifer Fried who has a theory on betrayal and talks about institutional betrayal and has a center called the Center for um, Institutional Courage. And I like her work a lot. And, and there were some lectures Friday night and the point was that awareness isn't enough. Um, and so the, the man, Dr. Worthington mentioned this. And I, I think in our breakout, we talked about other words like compassion and um, shame and betrayal, you know, like we, we try to just expand the conversation and, and that it's a process that's not easy individually or collectively, right? This is not, so I don't have the answers and all the solutions, but, but taking this on um, in my community is complex. That's what I would say. Thank you. And I think it's complex in every community. Uh, this is an extremely uh, uh, difficult, all of these actual uh, practices are difficult when you think about it. Um, when you think about having, finding joys in the midst of difficulties, that actually can get pretty difficult also in my experience. But I think uh, forgiveness is one of those that is really uh, uh, a difficult one. Any other thoughts, any reactions to, to those comments? Anybody else want to share some? Well, um, I'm in a town that has, a, I think like a lot of cities in the United States been struggling with um, trying to um, have a process where the community can uh, be involved in what policing is like. 
in the city and that has not gone very well and there is a recognized kind of massive rift between the people who have really been interacting with the police department and um, trying to make suggestions for change and the police department. Um, and uh, and one of the reasons for that is that most of the people who, they, they really are the community men members who, um, you know, have been frustrated with the police department. Uh, you know, one of them said to me, you know, until we started this process, we were at war um, with the police. And, and now we're trying to work together and that doesn't really work very well. Um, you know, that, and, and I thought, well, I, I don't think it's likely, but if we could get the police and the community members to sit down and, and learn forgiveness, um, they're both carrying a lot of resentments towards each other. Um, and if they could let them go, um, they would do a better job. It's interesting. I would say the police carry more resentments uh, or at least more barriers to communication than the community members, in spite of the fact that the community members are angry about people being killed. <laughs> so I'm not sure why that is, but uh, you know, it seems like it might, it might be helpful. Thank you. Yeah, that, that's an interesting point. Other thoughts, comments? Mark? Oh, well, you know, I mean, it's interesting that point about the police, isn't it? I, I, I We were having a little chat in, in, in our group and I was thinking how initially when, when, when the presentation began, I was, you know, to be honest, I was thinking, well, what's this got to do with this? And then um, I kind of warmed up to that. And, and it seems to me that and this may speak a little bit to the police thing, that since we are all enrolled inevitably in a system that is damaging the environment and damaging um, vulnerable communities and damaging ourselves, of course, then there's a process of self-forgiveness uh, needs to happen to be able to have that conversation, which is so challenging to our sense of identity and um, how we get our needs met. And just now I was thinking, maybe we need to forgive the climate or the, the, the ecology that we're part of for not behaving the way that we want it to. Interesting. Yeah, we'll talk to it about that um, and see what it says. You know, there's just my own thoughts on this and just observations is um, in my practice, we call it interbeing. Um, that understanding that we are connected to everything else and everybody else. Um, and that leads us to have compassion that we are really the same as others. So uh, in having it to the extent that we can develop that compassion and those presencing skills are vital to that and purposing skills to see that what the police are doing or others do that destroy the environment um, uh, is really, we have those same traits. We have those same qualities within us. And it's a question of what, what are we gonna nurture and what has been nurtured in others. Um, and that, when you sort of understand that we're, we're all sort of the same, uh, we have those kind of qualities, uh, then that allows, that compassion allows for the potential of beginning to have more honest conversations together. But when we come in believing I'm right, they're wrong, I'm good, they're bad, um, which is where we all then start, then um, that doesn't usually go very well. Uh, so that's just something to think about um, uh, that, you know, can we put ourselves in others' places that we really have a difficult time with and realize, oh, I've done something like that at some point in my life, or I, I can see that I have that potential. I've learned how to regulate myself to not do it, you know, et cetera. Uh, so, but that we, we're, we're all the same. We have those same qualities. So can we have compassion for ourselves and for others? But as Dr. Worthington said, it doesn't mean you forgive them and let them off the hook, 
but it just means we we can open ourselves possibly to more converse to have those better conversations and if you can help the police officers or the people that are abusing the nurses or the, the you know the healthcare system uh, administrators you know and others also address that issue come to grips with that understand what's happening maybe there's more potential uh, for it but it's not easy at any time at all it's always difficult any other comments thoughts before we end the day well let me just say again that those practices i talked about those six are really going to be important uh, I would uh, uh, encourage everybody to sort of look at those six, and I, we just did forgiveness for, as one of them, uh, and some communities and neighborhoods won't do forgiveness uh, or will only do it at the right time, right place when something happens, but you can always do uh, joy, you can do compassion, you can do uh, uh, other kinds of activities. And uh, by the way, I, I misspoke about my, uh, part, my friend's uh, James Barana's book, It's Awakening Joy. Um, so, um, I just want to sort of close then by saying that uh, when we engage in practices that enhance mental wellness and resilience and that compassion, that understanding that we're pretty much the same as one of those, uh, that's going to be essential to help ourselves and allow us to help others during the climate emergency. Uh, because only when you have the desire to free yourself, and I think Dr. Worthington talked about that, from suffering uh, by continually engaging in those kind of practices, uh, you'll be much more able to uh, join with others to help the community remain many well, mentally well and resilient as we do what's needed to reduce the climate emergency to manageable levels. So yeah, we have to uh, work on ourselves as much as we work on, uh, uh, on these issues with others. Uh, and again, always remember that if trauma can be passed down through generations, we can also build uh, the culture in communities and neighborhoods um, in our organizations to uh, pass on healing and transformational resilience. And this is our mission. So if you would, um, if you please do complete the session evaluation, it'll be posted in chat, but I'll, we'll send it to you afterwards. Uh, some suggested homework practice of presencing and purposing skill and try to teach it to someone else to your to your kids or to a colleague to friends um, uh, and then uh, share what you experienced today with a few other people in your organization or your uh, community we are going to hold an open session uh, on thursday of this week for, uh, at a one hour session at 7 p.m eastern time which is 4 p.m Pacific time. I'm very sorry that it's 12 midnight uh, in the UK. For those of you that might be there, uh, we will send out a, a Zoom link for that uh, later this afternoon. Uh, and if you can make it uh, for even part of the session, that's great. Um, I know that Red McKenzie wants to share a project she's working on, and we'll talk about that there uh, and just have a chance to talk. There's no agenda. We'll talk about it. And when we're done, we're done. Uh, although we will stop at uh, one, one hour. And then again, want to see you all for the final uh, community practice next Thursday. Um, we're going to talk about how to engage residents in other healing opportunities, but we're really going to uh, talk mostly about how to move to action, how to begin to move into what do we do to, to begin to build these, these uh, uh, resilience uh, uh, networks. And uh, Reverend Paula Abernathy, is the CEO of the Neighborhood Resilience Project going to talk to talk about how they engage residents uh, in healing, uh, and it's a very action-oriented uh, kind of program. And Father Abernathy is wonderful. So, with that, um, I wish you all a wonderful week. We'll see some of you on Thursday, and we'll see the rest of you next uh, Tuesday. So, have a good week, everyone. Take care. <laughs>